Uh, welcome to this Melbourne Press Club lunch. In fact, our last event of the year with uh, News Corp Chief Executive Julian Clark. And uh, I think you'd all agree, given the calibre of the guest, the Press Club is finishing the year with a bang. So we're very excited to hear from Julian very shortly. And I know he's very excited to get up here and talk to you uh, very shortly as well. Uh, my name is Michael Rowland. I'm a Vice President with feedback. Uh, of the, uh, of the Melbourne Press Club. I'm deputising for our president, Mark Baker, uh, who uh, is away at the moment. In fact, he's enjoying his uh, newfound liberation from the age. So uh, I got the job. In fact, there was a bit of discussion at the Press Club about just who would do this gig today. But in the end, we all knew just how much senior News Corp executives just love being introduced by ABC journalists. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank all of our Press Club sponsors who make these sort of events very possible for us. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank our principal sponsor, Monash University, who is represented here today by Phil Chubb. Our premium sponsors as well, Minta Ellison Lawyers, represented by the Press Club's very hard-working treasurer, David Poulton, who's here as well. Our RACV, RACV, flying the flag for them, is Robert Hogan. And finally, Crown, represented by the fabulous Anne Peacock, who's here today as well. I'd also like to acknowledge our major media sponsors, of course, The Age, The Herald Sun, Leader Newspapers, Metro Media Publishing, 3AW, Channels 7, 9 and 10, and of course, the ABC. And thanks also to our other major sponsors, law firm Kelly Hazel Quill, I got the name right today, Justin, Telstra and Swinburne University. So thank you as well, uh, um, and we mean it because the sponsors do mean an awful a lot to us at the press club. Just very quickly, while I have your attention, a reminder that the entries open this week officially for the 2013 Quill Awards. And you'll be pleased to note the Press Club has come crashing into the 21st century because you can now put your applications in online as opposed to all that messy paperwork. So if you go to www.melbournepressclub.com and get cracking, the entries close on February the 7th. Now, Julian Clark has had a number of titles and descriptions in his long and very distinguished career at News Corp, but the latest certainly has to be the comeback kid. There he was back in August, enjoying his semi-retirement when the phone call came from the top asking Julian to come back as the News Corp chief executive. In announcing the appointment, Rupert Murdoch described Julian as having immense energy and the clarity of vision necessary to drive News's various properties forward at a challenging time in the media. Now, Julian Clark's return to the fray attracted almost universal acclaim. Businessman and former Fairfax chairman, one time foe, Ron Walker, said of Julian at the time, he never raises his voice and gets the job done without personal aggression. Media by Harold Mitchell said Julian had a great mind for social justice and always gives a fair hearing, but Harold also said he, at the same time, is no pushover. On the other hand, former Herald Sun editor Bruce Guthrie said Rupert had gone for generational change, except he'd gone up rather than down. And Bruce also said that Julian was simply warming the seat for Lachlan Murdoch. Well, as we know of Julian's career, you can hardly describe him as a seat warmer. He has been with News Corp or his associated companies for 30 years. He was, of course, the managing director of the Herald and Weekly Times group for 16 years until stepping down in 2007. He's also served as the Deputy Chief Executive of News Queensland, News, uh, sorry, News is Queensland Press, and he's also held positions on both the News Corp Australia and HWT boards, including, of course, a stint as HWT, HWT Chairman. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Julian's successor as HWT Chair, Penny Fowler, who's here today as well. Penny, welcome to you. Uh, now, since taking on the job, Julian has moved very quickly to make significant changes to the editorial structure of News Corp to allow it to better deal with the many challenges facing not just that company, but of course every media organisation at the moment. So let's hear now from the man himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julian Clark. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. I enjoyed the introduction. Um, 
I'd rather relieved though that you didn't repeat what one of the wags in the Hull Street bunker said to me some time ago that I was actually the Steve Bradbury of, uh, <laughs> of uh, <coughs> but anyhow all of that's true um, when I was trying to put my thoughts together as to what I might say to you today I couldn't help but come up with a whole lot of questions that I would have been asking me had I been sitting down there and those sort of questions are obviously about the elephant in the room. What is, where is, where are newspapers in their life cycle? What business models are we assured of to carry the forward business, the business forward in such a labour intensive and capital intensive business? What's the future for journalism and in fact the future for journalists? Well, I'm going to answer those questions I think probably indirectly, but I want to put a question to you today, and that is, would you recommend your son or your daughter to a career in the newspaper business? Now, of course, implicit in all of these questions are, as I said, what are the, what are the implications of the future for a business such as ours? It's viability. Before we get into that, though, I would like to set some historical content, uh, context, if I could, please. Circulations in Melbourne of the Metropolitan Dailies peaked in the mid-1970s. You have to say, why was it the 1970s? Was it television? Well, no, television launched, as you know, in 56. So we saw newspapers grow in their circulations for 20 years beyond that. So what was it that caused the peaking in the mid-70s? From my own experience, when you get a change in behaviour like we saw in the mid-70s, there's usually a number of dynamics, a number of forces at work that cause that sort of situation. And what were they? Well, I've got four that I'd like to put to you as a, as a, a theory. In the mid-70s, television went colour. Now that made it a very different medium from what it was prior to that, for two reasons. One, it enhanced the experience of the viewer, but even more importantly and devastating, I think, for our business, it became the best branding device that mankind had ever, had ever devised in terms of advertising. And so as a direct result of that, it rewrote advertising budgets like we had never seen before. Colour television is the first point. The second point in the mid-70s were the satellites. The result of the satellites going up, of course, was that we, the newspaper business, lost our immediacy. Instead of people lining up outside news agents to find out what had, what had happened in the preceding hours, locally or overseas, all of a sudden they could see it live in their lounge rooms as it actually happened. And so what did we do? As a business, as an industry, we retreated to soft news, to features and to opinion. And breaking stories, breaking news became less of a priority. And with that, there was a cultural effect in our newsrooms. And for those of us as old as I am, we've lived through that. We saw that cultural change. The other contributing factor from my point of view are regional shopping centres. Now you might say, where is this conversation going? I want to try and pull it all together in a little while. Regional shopping centres, of course, in the mid-70s became a way of life. They became an entertainment experience for people. But the important thing from our point of view was, our business, was it transferred dollars away from the CBD in the high streets of our, of our suburbs and transferred them into the Chadstons. And with that appearance came a new tier of retailers, smart specialty retailers that were going to change the very profile, the face of shopping in, 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 in Australia. The fourth one is what I've referred to as heat set catalogue printing. And this was so influential at the time that it basically buried afternoon newspapers. Afternoon newspapers, the Melbourne Herald was a great example of this. They lived off retail advertising. And in the mid-70s, with the regional shopping centres and heat set colour printing, all of a sudden, 
um, the, the advertising dollars transferred from recognised media into these catalogues. And in fact, the retailers became publishers in their own right. So, in summary, what happened in the mid-70s, it was a seismic shift. We can talk about this retrospectively. It wasn't recognised at the time, but this is actually what happened. So in the 1970s, we had, if you like, a perfect storm. Disruptive technology, colour television, catalogues. Major shift in shopping behaviour. Fragmentation, the advertising dollar, the budgets were fragmented far beyond what they had ever occurred before. It led, in severe terms, to the demise of afternoon newspapers and therefore consequential loss of jobs. Sounds familiar? So did that leave us in utter despair? Certainly not. And what was our response? What was the industry's response? Well, I can tell you what our company's response was. All of a sudden, there was a massive consolidation of the newspaper industry. And that was in first in the form of a $2 billion takeover of the Herald and Weekly Times by News Limited. It was the largest takeover in the history of Australia at that time, in 1987. That led then to massive investment in technology. $1 billion we spent, News Limited, around Australia establishing new print sites. On top of that, we invested heavily in front-end editorial systems and business systems. Importantly, though, we created, as a result of that, new advertising revenue streams in the form of colour loadings. Now, for those of you who are not involved in the commercial side of your businesses, you may not have been aware of how much revenue that generated. And that all flowed out of the investments that I, to which I have referred. And with all of that in place, what then happened? Huge product development. We moved from an engineering phase in the organisation to a product development phase in the name of new sections, which were mainly about lifestyle, Sunday newspapers in Melbourne, which was brand new, weekend colour magazines, and even commuter newspapers in the form of the much beloved MX. So was this the reaction of a company or an industry taking cover from a perfect storm? Hardly. We were fighting to survive, yes, but we did. We came out of that stronger than ever. So enough of the history lesson, but let's talk about the contemporary perfect storm. On the Richter scale, this is of a much higher level than what I referred to in the 70s. What we are seeing are new platforms, digital uh, Revolution, disruptive, te disruptive technology everywhere, new players with the lowering of entry barriers, social media, no longer are we the gatekeepers of people's expression, fragmentation everywhere of audiences and advertisers, and aggregators are having a field day scraping our content with no absolute regard to IP. This is, the op this is the landscape that we're now all operating in. And as a result of that, we've all had to face restructuring with the consequential job losses that have gone with that. Our business models are either badly shaken or in some cases destroyed. And worse than all, news is now considered to be by some, not by me, but certainly by some as just a mere commodity where the source is no longer important. So is this utter despair now? Well, certainly not on my part. We have reason, good reason, for real concern. We are definitely playing for keeps. We're on a road that has not been travelled before. And we are all taking huge punts on competitive strategy and technology. But there's one good thing that comes out of all of this, as far as I'm concerned, and that is that no one is immune. No one is immune from this, which means that the competitive landscape for anybody trying to get in is going to be just as tough as it is for those who occupy the territory at the moment. And when you get into a situation like this, what does history actually tell us? 
Well, for me, it tells, tells us that the spoils will go to those who have the best assets, who have real strategic clarity around what they're doing, the requirement of deep pockets, those that have compelling customer value proposition, and the spoils will go to those that have the best technology and the best talent. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there are two things that need to be faced up to here. One is, is it possible for this industry of ours to retain our audiences and in fact grow them? And the second issue, even more importantly, is how are we going to turn these new audiences, different audiences, into going concerns from a business point of view? How are we going to monetize these, these assets? Well, the, 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 the question for me is, are you going to rely totally on advertising dollars for this, or are you going to go to a subscription model where people are asked to pay for digital content? Paying for digital content, of course, depends very much on what you're asking people to buy. And this is where I have probably a different opinion than most people. But if you're asking them to buy a 40-minute daily experience and be engaged with a brand that they both like and trust, a brand with new technology that opens up three-dimensionally, that has with it video, amazing graphics, beautiful pictures, relevant content, and even the opportunity of transactional activity on that same digital platform. This, to me, is what the future is all about. This is really exciting. This is, for me, the long-term future. This successfully will engage a new generation of people. And not only that, importantly for us within our organisations, it will develop a whole new wave of crea creative talent. For me, it's a link of print and digital. It is not a matter of one or the other. It is using the power of both. Now, I speak, obviously, from a point of position that may be different from other people in this room. But we have very strong newspaper brands that are very much alive and very much uh, profitable. So our game plan will be about using both these assets in partnership, using the power of both. On the matter of news being a commodity, you know, this is exactly what our opponents want us to do. Our opponents want us to go down this commodity path where there is little reader engagement, where there is no brand loyalty, where advertisers will pay you tuppence per, cl per click. This, for me, is just a slippery slope to nowhere. It's a slippery slope to disaster. For me, the choice is quite stark. As I said earlier, the spoils here are for people who have got the best assets. And that is why, I suppose, in the role that I'm playing at the moment, I feel pretty relaxed about the position. Pretty relaxed because News Corp, I think, in Australia is in not only a position to survive, but in a position to thrive. In my view, we have a great mix of assets. We have strong newspapers that are national at a metropolitan, at a regional and a suburban level. We have newspaper apps that have subscribers that are linked both journalistically and commercially to their newspaper partners. We have masthead websites that are both subscribed to and have huge audiences. We have a fistful of verticals, both websites and apps, a lot of them involved in certain categories. An example of that would be 
uh, our lifestyle verticals. We have news.com.au, which is Australia's number one free news site. 3.1 million UAs per month. 3.1 million UAs per month. And we also are involved in broadcast. Owning Fox Sports is a tremendously important link to where we're going in the future. Our 50% partnership with Telstra, with Foxtel, again, is a tremendously important asset inside our stable. And of course, we have a major shareholding in REA, which is now a $5 billion company. But a, perhaps the best thing from my point of view, on top of all of that, is to be able to work with the international colleagues that we have around the world. These are people and these are assets that are in exactly the same position as us in Australia and yet are making huge headway in terms of where, where they're going as a future. The Times, The Sun in London, Wall Street Journal, The New York Post. These are conversations going inside our organisation that are giving clarity to where we're going as a future. So can I finish where I started? Would you recommend your son or your daughter to a career in newspapers? Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Julie. And uh, we can throw the floor now open to questions. I ask you if you are asking a question to uh, state your name and um, who you're with or where you're from. Barry, I know who you are. Barry Dunstan. Barry Donovan. Barry Donovan. Julian, uh, the National Broadcaster, uh, the ABC. Yep. Um, some of my best friends were for it, including my daughter. I'd certainly recommend her to go and uh, work in the media. Uh, what I'm interested in today is uh, your feelings today about the role of the ABC and also your feelings about the role of the ABC going into the future. Well, my personal view is that the ABC is a very, very important institution in the media landscape here. Um, I'm a personal user of it and as I, as I, I know a great percentage of Australians are. Um, so I don't have anything negative to say about it. Um, I think it supplies, uh, it, it fits into the media landscape. Um, and uh, uh, there's a, a number of issues that I suppose you're alluding to, but I don't nece necessarily want to be drawn on those today. Next question. Well, I was going to ask this as well, and there's a fair bit of self-interest here as well, uh, picking up on um, Barry's question. Why is the Australian obsessed with the ABC? <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of good copy comes out of the ABC. Um, I don't know about obsessed with it. But, you know, you've got to allow for my bias in these things, but I think the Australian is a mighty fine newspaper. Uh, and it plays a role in certainly in our stable and I think in the total uh, Australian media landscape that is very different from everything else. It's found its own position and I think it does it very, very well. I think, um, you know, it's a prestige newspaper and so is the ABC. They both operate in the same space so you, you, you're going to see uh, sort of the competitive nature of that. But, um, I read The Australian every day and I, don't, I don't, wouldn't describe it as being obsessed with the ABC. No more than any other of the, uh, the, the media businesses in Australia. Any other questions? Tony. Uh, Tony Henrington from News Corp Australia. Uh, Julian, you, you talked about um, potential for growth. Do you believe the, uh, the difficult times where consolidation and cost cutting, uh, which have been a major part of media landscape for the last two years um, is behind us and do you feel we are heading into that growth period immediately? Well, I, thanks Tony. I think um, my attitude to that would be um, there are still big questions about the fixed costs of businesses like ours. There's no doubt about that. But the future has got to be about growing. 
It's got to be about growth. Now, I see our business in two parts. I see the creative front end of it, which is basically anybody in our business that's involved in generating audience or revenue. Uh, th there can be no reduction of that. You've got to stay with that and you've got to grow the business through the creative front end of the business. The back end of it, of course, is very, very different. And we are, you know, we've been operating, our company's been operating here in this town since 1840. So over the years, you develop all sorts of fixed overheads that really don't come under scrutiny until such time as there are a need to. And is there a need at the moment? Yes, there is. But I think f for this audience in particular, um, it depends where you go. I mean, I was making this, this stark choice between whether we go down a, a media um, asset that is absolutely connected to its audience, where there is a relationship. You will not do that on this, on the, this, you know, on an oily rag, smell of an oily rag. That requires. That's a labour-intensive business that requires professional journalism, curation of of of, of, of what we produce. So I think the days of, of you know uh, cutting that to ribbons are probably gone. Um, but the back end of the business is very much under review all the time. Come on, people. There's a lot to ask. It was such a great speech. I'll, I'll ask another question. Greg, Greg Highwood from Fairfax, Julian, has left open the option of within three to five years of ceasing print publication of at least the Monday to Friday SMH and The Age. Is that something that News Corp is considering as well? No. No, no you'd only consider that if you'd given up on, the, on the, the print part of it. No. I mean, our company is totally uh, dependent on keeping the print going. Journalistically, I still consider what you see on a front page of a newspaper, the hard copy of a newspaper, pa journalistically, is still much more powerful than anything you'll see on a screen. The audiences can be, can be different. Uh, the, one, the two audiences can be the same size. But the power of what you see in your hand in print, journalistically, is terribly important. And uh, you know, our future is very much, as I've said, working these two things in partnership. The, the, the newspaper, and its partner app will be where the future is for all of us. I'm sure about this. You get on to, you know, anybody can share this experience, trains or trams in the city, and with young people, you don't see newspapers. You, you see MX, but of course it's there at the stations. Um, it's a very popular read on the way home. How do you go about engaging, and it's a question for all media groups, the, the younger demographic, you know, the, the 16 to 30 year olds to uh, keep buying your product, be it a print version or paying money for an app or uh, access to a, through a paywall? Mm. Well, look, m maybe I can explain something that I, uh, I should have given more details before. But when you look at the digital businesses that we're all, all the platforms we're operating in, at one end you've got the app, which is, you know, the Times now, the app of the Times in London, there's, is 40 minutes per, per day on average, whereas the paper itself is 33. The app has gone past the hard copy newspaper. So um, you t at, the, at the extreme end, you've got this high, very sticky relationship between the asset, the masthead, and the use, both in print and in digital form. At the other end, you've got the websites, which are basically, on average, I think the age is, is probably six or seven minutes per, 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 per person. The Herald Sun's not far behind that. They, the, the, the relationship between the user and the website is totally different. So you then got to look at the distribution channels. The, and you're talking about with the app, it will be, so much of it will be on a, on a tablet. That's where the experience is. It's a, you know, it's a horizontal read, there's a start, there's a finish, there's the three dimensions of the video and everything else that goes with it. Whereas the tablet, of course, younger generation, sorry, the uh, mobile is very much where they are. But if you look at the time spent, the, the, mo the M sites are like this during the day. The app is huge peak in the morning and a huge peak at night. So they're, they're very different, uh, very different the, the application, the usage of those, two, those things. So I think whoever's you know, making decisions strategically in, in whatever company, they have to be very clear about what, we, we talk about digital as though it's 
there's very different components inside the digital world and, and they will require very different strategies and quite frankly very different advertising models. The, the websites, um, you know, as I said, were being chased down by an advertising revenue model that just won't work. This business of paying per click, I think, is a, is a disaster. What, what, why is that? <coughs> um, well, the rates that you pay. Um, it's just not where the future will be. Whereas, again, if I could make a point, there are two types of uh, advertisers. There is an advertiser who's wanting to attract an audience that's not looking for them, and the old media still dominate that category. There's an advertiser who was want to be where the destination is, and realestate.com, car sales, uh, you know, employment, wherever, they're the destination sites. So the advertising for the active market has gone to the destination sites and the websites and the search engines are where is where that business is and for the foreseeable future. But for every marketing dollar that's spent, half of that is still spent trying to attract people who aren't looking. So the app is a leading, you know, it's, it's an experience that all of a sudden you see a full page ad here for, a, for a, the new Lexus or whatever, you touch it and it opens up to a 30 second TVC. So this is where the future is and this is where the future will be, I think, for younger people. As I say, this will open up a new generation. Yes, David Paulson. Too boppish sort of questions. Speak up, David. Uh, I'll ask. A, as I hope. I hope it's not a too boppish sort of question. Um, but uh, one of the um, resources that, uh, that our major media providers like like you have um, is the uh, is the the archive uh, in terms of say the Herald Sun. It's uh, it's 90 years or so, and uh, the Australian now over nearly 50 years. Uh, one of the best resources I think on the national libraries. Uh, website is their uh, their digitised versions of the Argus and many other newspapers. Um, can you tell us where you're at with uh, with that? Do you see it as a property that is something that you can uh, that you can monetise to some extent? And um, are you uh, are you looking at, uh, at putting say that and it, it, the Herald as well would be in over 100 years of, uh, of newspapers? Are they going to be coming online as a, a digital resource in the near future? Well, they are very big revenue streams right now as we speak. Um, people are paying for access to, to the libraries and in the case of news it's millions of dollars per year generated out of this. But there's two things. One is the, st the stuff that's created digitally and of course that is there, it's captured and we can use it. It's, it's retrospectively what you do with the old stuff that's important and as we all know you know, there are hundreds of thousands of photographs there and you have to make decisions as to which of those you're going to actually digitise and, and, and uh, use uh, historically. But I think this is one of the great assets of the business. When you've, when, uh, in the case of, as I say, the Melbourne Herald starting in 1840, the history that's been built up over those years, it's resident in all of these photos and files and everything else that we've got there. They're one of the great resources. Uh, in, the, in our community, used, as I say, commercially, but certainly used uh, on a day-by-day -day basis to put out our newspapers. Justin Quill, watch out for this guy. He asks the hard questions. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, Joanne, I'm interested uh, to know your views on, on or whether you think media is still uh, at threat uh, from a predatory speech perspective, seeing both sides of politics really trying to control the media and uh, the news of course um, led the way in terms of the right to know campaign that was fairly successful. We saw um, uh, a pushback against Stephen Conroy's plans not too long ago. Now um, where do you think we sit now? Do you think we still need to be vigilant or do you think we've um, fought off the aggressors or, or what are your views in terms of uh, those issues? No, I think uh, we, we need to be continually vigilant with this. I mean, um, it's a complex argument um, and News Corp fought that fight basically on its own, to be frank, and um, we thought it was that important. We got very little support from anybody else. 
uh, but it was an important uh, battle to win. And quite frankly, I think everybody knows that whenever it's raised again, we'll be doing exactly the same response. Terribly important. And uh, for those in this room that might have wondered the stance we took at the time, I hope you now realise that it was an important thing and, and, and done on everybody's behalf. Well, we weren't, um, and we certainly would have been interested in having a look at it, but I don't, that's a hypothetical question which I, I can't answer. And also, um, with the Daily Mail and the Guardian entering Australia, is that a sign of confidence in the media industry, or do you think that the traditional players like Fairfax News would sort of be fighting with a great pool of media players for the same dollars? You know, I think the, the competition is heating up by the day. But as I said before, um, the beaut part about what's happened with all of this segmentation and fragmentation is that it's tough for everybody to enter, either sustain their current business or to enter into a new market. So they're going to have their hands full, and, and I would think from Fairfax's point of view, certainly from News's point of view, we're, we're happy to have the blue. It'll be on. Given you talk about apps and people on their phones and the like, uh, looking for rich content, doesn't it make sense to buy a television network and provide that video content much more thoroughly in the same way that the ABC can, for instance? And secondly, what's your view on, on scoops and given we're all digital now, holding them for the paper or putting them out straight away? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question though. Shouldn't you buy a TV station? <laughs> <laughs> Back question. Well, we've got to stay within the law, and at the moment that's not possible. Um, but, but, but look, broadcast is, you know, uh, getting access to video is terribly important in our business and the future of the picture that I've painted, which I hope I've enunciated clearly. Video is going to play an important part in that future. There's no doubt about that. This is the butte part about, as I, I refer to it as the three dimensions, this is actually now print and television basically coming together in, in, in the one medium. Uh, and goodness knows what's around the corner in terms of technology, how this is all going to open up. So this is why I remain absolutely positive about, about the future. Uh, it's the question of the business models that go with it. And I, we have got particular views on how to, to make that work. And the second part was? Well, um, no, I, I think the days of holding a scoop are probably over. But look, you know, the way we're running our newsrooms now, the editors of our papers are, are over all of the, whatever the, the, uh, the platform is, they're over all of it. So they will make decisions on the run to see how best to handle that. And again, I think once we, we see this as a coordinated uh, platform agnostic view of life, then those sort of questions go away. It's horses for courses on the, on the, on the, the facts of the, of the moment. So um, the days of holding you know, a story over, if there's an oil spill in Port Phillip Bay, we're not going to hold over until you know, we can get it tomorrow morning. We'll have, an, we'll have an, an angle tomorrow morning that we wouldn't have had, but it'll be digitally there for sure. Just picking up on that, do you encourage your journalists to engage with social media, to, to use Twitter? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yep. To both comment yep. and get news stories out. Yeah, no, that's understood and, and uh, uh, recommended. Tony. Uh, Tony Henry, uh, Julian, when's, it's about five it's months. It's not a Dorothy Dixon, is it? No, no, no. Well, not there. Um, it's about five months since you took on this current role. Um, what, were, what was the thing that impressed you most when you stepped through the door again and conversely disappointed you the most when you took back over this role, when you looked at the company? Um, just a bit of background. I mean, even though I had retired from running the Herald Weekly Times, I was very, very close to the business still, chairing the Herald Weekly Times, but also very involved with news. So there were no real surprises. Uh, my relationship with, with Kim Williams was better than a 
collegiate one. We were mates, and still are. Um, so there have been ongoing conversations about, you know, all the all the things I've discussed about it as just a continuous conversation that I've had for probably ten years. So there's no real surprises, and quite frankly, no no great disappointments. I mean, I've I've made some changes. There's no doubt about that, but. Um, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with our assets. I'm very impressed with the talent we've got inside the organisation. And I've got to say, I'm very impressed with the boss's attitude to things. I mean, he's just so excited about the future and wants to get behind it commercially and in every other way. So, um, no, no, I'm very happy with, with uh, what we're dealing with. Yes. Uh Speak up, Trevor. Sorry, I've got Hi, uh, Julian, when do you expect the revenue declines in Australian newspapers to bottom out? The question was, if anybody didn't hear it, uh, when Julian expects the revenue declines in the newspaper business to bottom out? Yesterday, actually. <laughs> No, look, there's two things. One's the circulation revenue and the other's the advertising. Uh, circulation revenues and advertising revenues, you really need to address those separately. Um, the circulation revenues will depend totally on how far you go down the subscription path versus the, the, the free path with your digital businesses. Um, and advertising revenues, I think we're starting to see some pick up. The, 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 um, but the real growth will come, I think, when we convert the digital businesses, particularly the apps, into very strong display advertising media. Um, and that's that's a key to I think for for all of our futures. So when do you think that's going to happen? Well, I, I, it's starting to happen already, but it'll progressively. I mean, I, I liken it to it's it's a rough analogy, but I I, I mentioned before, didn't I, that um, that we saw revenue growth coming from the colour loadings that came with the new print sites. Well. I'm hoping and I'm guessing that that will come with the apps and the advertising opportunities because all of a sudden there is an ability for an advertiser, this is a display advertiser, to actually deepen the information that you can't get on the two dimensions of a page, a printed page, but you can certainly get it on the three dimensions of a, of a uh, digital uh, platform. So, so I think the real question is in the media mix that these major advertisers have, and we all know the major advertisers, who they are in Australia. The question is, what part will this landscape that I've been talking about play in their media mix? My guess is it'll actually play an important part. Let's not be, you know, let's not be anything but convinced that print is still the dominant medium for major advertisers who are creating store traffic, whether it be re whether it be merchandise or um, or uh, services, newspapers are still a, along with television and outdoor and magazines and radio, the old media as it's referred to, they still dominate this display advertising uh, requirement. Just another question: Could you answer the question that you posed at the beginning of your address? Would you recommend a career in newspapers for your son or daughter? Well, I've got two in the business, so. Uh, <laughs> One son and one daughter, both in the business. But if you had, say, they weren't in the business, Brands would you? No, I, 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 it was a rhetorical question, but, but really, I would. I'd be careful who I work for. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the next thing I'd like to ask. Where would they get a job? Uh, as a journalist? Yes. Um, I think there's still a period where we're settling everything down. But um, look, it's not going to be a growth industry as far as hiring journalists are concerned. That's, I'd be misleading you if I said that was the case. But quite frankly, I do not close off what the future might look like in terms of, um, of, of this, this industry that we're in, the profession that we're in. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if we go, as I said, I, I, I drew this 1970s, if you like, analogy because what happened out of that? Businesses like ours and Fairfax and the television uh, industry, they actually grew out of that. They did something about it. They invested in the future and they invested in talent. And I, and I think, we, yes, we are going through a period where we're resolving a lot of issues, 
But once that gets done, I think you'll find that growth might be the, the next period. Yep. Could you elaborate on the transactions uh, that you were talking about before? Is that um, using existing businesses or buying businesses that you can transact? No, no, the, sorry. Um, the, the transaction I referred to is that the, the tablet, the digital tablet, is transactional. Okay. So there's no reason why you can't connect to an advertiser's URL or I can subscribe to something. I mean, it's, this, is, this has got everything going for it that we've dreamed of. And to be able to transact while somebody's actually connected and has a relationship with your brand, with your masthead, is just, this is fantastic. Nick. Hi, Julian. Nick Lees. Hi, Nick. How are you? Good, thank um, you. I promised I was going to ask about the Daily Mail, but my friend here at the A just covered that off. So I'll ask about the ABC instead. Uh, I'm not obsessed. But uh, I just wondered if you had a view on uh, the ABC's involvement in digital media, uh, publishing online, and uh, what your response has been uh, to the idea that if they are going to be in that area, they should look at advertising more. Good, good question, Nick. It needs a considered response. Um, I think there are two parts to that. Um, the first is the first question I would ask is why is a business like the ABC funded? It's a government-owned and run business. Why is it w operating in the commercial space? It's a question. Um, now. Malcolm Turnbull's response to that is, well, the concerns that the private um, uh, publishers and media have got is, is, is not the ABC the problem, it's a lack of advertising revenue. So he separates those two things. And, they, and he's quite correct, they are two separate things. How we grow our advertising revenue has got nothing to do with whether the ABC exists or not. But nevertheless, the audiences are absolutely fragmented and um, as the ABC, who knows around, what's around the corner, as the ABC keeps moving into other spaces that you would, I think, reasonably expect that that's, uh, that's something that the private uh, sector should be doing. Uh, it raises a whole lot of questions, certainly in my mind, as to whether, you know, what we've got, I think, as I said earlier, the ABC is a very, very important institution in the Australian landscape. The question is, whatever comes in the future, should they continue to push into that area? And at that point, you have to ask the question, why is a government-funded business doing this? And other people have different responses to that. I just think at some time, somebody's got to say, look, I think we, we now understand um, there's a whole industry out here that is doing it on its own, paying all its bills, no government subsidy whatsoever, and it should be allowed to do that. Mike, Mike Smith. Uh, Julian, Mike Smith, Press Club Committee. Um, traditionally, one of the biggest advertisers in newspapers was government, Commonwealth and state. And I think in some years, in some papers, the Commonwealth government has been the number one mm. revenue driver in, in yep. advertising. Yep. What's happened to government advertising in the uh, migration to online? Are they staying with newspapers or are they going on to their own sites, their own websites? And as a, as a publisher, what do you do to protect that turf, um, encourage government advertising, draw more of it in at a time when there are all sorts of tensions between the media and the government? Well, look, in any advertising decisions, you've got to have the audience. You've got to deliver the audience that the advertiser wants. And you've got, it's either got to be qualitative in terms of the type of people that they want to, advertise, that they want to meet and, 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 and reach, or it has to be sufficient in numbers to warrant it. So if, if our business and our industry doesn't grow and continue to hold its numbers for every advertiser, including the federal government, become less of a prospect. Um, but I think, um, so you know, you, we've got a business issue here that we've got to deal with. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure whether I've said this today or not, the jury is not only out, it's back on whether you can grow your audiences, but it is a combination of print and digital. The Australian's a great example of this. The audience of the Australian, the size of the audience this year, is significantly greater than it was last year. 
Now its print numbers are, are down, but its digital is up. The combination of both is so. This is why I see them operating as you know in, in, in partnership, the two things. Um, as far as the federal government is concerned, they're advertising budgets. Um, it depends what part of the, of the election cycle you're in. I mean, there's all the tactics that go with running governments and how they want to convince everybody in the last, uh, in the last year, particularly they're worth re-electing. So I think that will continue, but there's no doubt that the fragmentation, the segmentation of the, of the whole audience, the media audience, is affecting advertising dollars right across the board. But I, I would say, this colour of the month that's been operating for in recent times, that old media seem to be on the way out and that the new thing is, you know, a click here and a click there, I'm sensing that that, that wheel is turning. Now, it's just a personal view I have, but I think you'll find that, that, that that's become so hot uh, over such a short period that it's burning out a little bit. What we're finding is that advertisers now want a relationship with the audience rather than this in and out, in and out, in and out. You don't get it on the websites. I mean, they're the facts. The news websites I'm talking about. We've got time for one or two more questions. Yeah, Isabel. Just to, you, you talk about the importance of figuring out the model um, and figuring out the right combination, uh, the, the model that will work both probably for the readers and for advertisers. My question is, if you're running a business as big as News Corp in Australia, how do you maintain the flexibility to keep that model from constantly, like, to, to, to maintain its evolution as the landscape changes, which it seems to be doing very quickly at the moment? I think being large is, is probably helpful. I mean, as I said, the future will be about don't try and take any of this on, come into this market unless you've got deep pockets. That's, they'll be the road rules from here on in for anybody because it's going to be so competitive um, that and people will be defending their businesses very, very strongly. So I think being large and having deep pockets, which um, is going to be a, a requirement for the future. So I think that allows you to have the, the sort of, if you like, the flexibility. Other people would call it cross-subsidy. That's been going on forever. So, you know, there are things that you're growing that you invest in. They, they go through a loss phase until they get to a break-even phase and then they, they, they go into profit. So that's part of the, the, the commercial mix, has always been thus and will continue to be. And uh, lady down there with the last question of the Hi, afternoon. I'm just wondering, going back to uh, the quantity versus quality uh, aspect you were talking about earlier, with the mastheads and the brands that you have, um, for example, um, in England, The Sun versus The Times, is there any one of those particular audiences and brands that you feel is going to uh, generate the most value for News Corp in this digital environment? Numbers versus value per capita, for, for instance? Um. Well, again, London is the centre of the universe as far as newspaper publishing and media publishing is concerned. It's so segmented, um, very segmented. Um, so, you know, what we've talked about there is a huge mid-market uh, paper with the sun and a prestige aimed at the top end of the market w with the times. So it depends where you position these, these publications in the... You know, I always, always think about it in terms of, a, of the, the grid with socioeconomics down one side and political disposition down the bottom, mad left to mad right. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, you'll be able to position a newspaper in that grid. You can do it here in Melbourne and you can do it anywhere in the world, certainly in the English speaking world you can. So it's a matter of where the publication sees itself being positioned. Um, now, uh, the, the digital world is open right across the board. It will be used uh, right across the board. With, uh, with the Australian, we see that as a premium publication in the Australian and its connections with Business Spectator, which we talked about before, and with uh, the Wall Street Journal, etc. These are terribly important connections inside the premium part of the business. But if you're talking about a paper like here in Melbourne, the Herald Sun, we're quite clear about where that paper sits. It's in 70% of the total population. 
and we're not going to let it get below that. It has to be bang in the middle of the whole of this, this marketplace here in Melbourne and, and wider Victoria. So again, this is about clarity around strategic thinking and clarity around what you're actually trying to do. And I think it, beho it behoves organisations and certainly people who are influential at the top of those organisations to be absolutely clear about how they're positioning and everything else flows from that. That's where we have to wrap, wrap it up. Uh, Julian, I know you're tremendously busy at the moment. Thank you very much for a very entertaining and informative speech. And just as importantly, thanks for engaging with our audience on uh, the key issues facing our industry today. Please, ladies and gentlemen, thank Julian Clark. That is where we end uh, today's proceedings. Just a very quick note, um, if you aren't already a member of the Melbourne Press Club, please consider signing up. It is pretty affordable and as you'll see, uh, the uh, benefits uh, are great. So you'll, you'll see great speakers like Julian going into 2014. You can go to melbournepressclub.com. Otherwise, thank you very much for your company. Have a great Christmas and we'll see you all in 2014. Thank you.